can help to develop models of economic and social organization based on mutual cooperation, avoiding both the inequities of the market and the coercion of the state. Today, the market and the state are thought to be the principal modes of economic organization, and we seem to be condemned to choose between the inefficiency and authoritarianism of the state, and on the one hand, and the ruthlessness and inequity of the market on the other. But in fact, many economic and social activities can also be based on voluntary cooperation, and the latter can be greatly facilitated by a culture of public spiritedness. And the third reason, you know, this is going towards more long-term objectives, is that the growth of public spiritedness can be seen as one aspect of the need for moral progress to catch up with technological and scientific progress. In the last 100 years, humanity has made tremendous technological and scientific advances, and this has, has helped us to achieve what the economist Angus Deaton aptly calls the great escape from human and deprivation that has taken place around the world in the last 100 years. But um, this progress has also generated great dangers and threat to human survival, whether it's nuclear weapons, uh, other weapons of mass destruction, uh, terrorism, climate change, the misuse of genetic engineering, and so on and so forth. And it seems to me that unless our moral standards and social norms evolve and enable us to handle these new powers and technologies, our days may be numbered. Uh, Tagore, 100 years ago, already expressed quite nicely this uh, contrast between the very rapid growth of science and technology on the one hand and the lack of uh, improvement in uh, the lack of moral, moral progress. He said, uh, speaking specifically of the West, but I think today we could say the same about the world as a whole, he said that man with his mental and material power far outgrowing his moral strength is like, is an, is like an exa exaggerated giraffe whose head has suddenly shot miles away from the rest of him, making normal communication difficult to establish. This greedy head, with its huge dental organization, has been munching all the topmost foliage of the world, but the nourishment is too late in reaching his digestive organs, and his heart is suffering from want of blood. Of this present disharmony in man's nature, the West seems to have been blissfully unconscious. He was talking of the West, but we could say the same thing about the world as a whole. Um, so these are some reasons, among many others, why we would take interest in this topic. Uh, moving on, uh, public spiritedness, I adopted this term, one could adopt other terms. Um, it's not easy to define exactly, and the moment you give an exact definition, there are some loose ends, so I'm not going to um, propose an exact definition. But to start with, uh, we can try to define it by contrast with its opposite, which is better understood and usually known as antisocial behavior. Uh, there are many examples, many familiar examples of antisocial behavior, like uh, taking phone calls during a lecture, as Ritika had asked you not to do, playing loud music at night, jumping the queue, throwing garbage on the street, smoking in a public place, sleeping on duty, obstructing an ambulance, leaving the lights on when you leave a room, breaking social or international conventions, and just to give one more example, uh, what is known in India as chain pulling. When you when the, in the train, the train passes just in front of your house, you pull the chain so that you can get off in front of your house. And obviously, if everyone does that, the train will never get to its destination. So these are all examples of things that a public spirited person would not do. Um, if you ask me to give a definition, I would say something like this, that public spiritedness is a reasoned, reasoned habit of consideration for the collective interest. Now let me explain that because every word matters. A reasoned habit of consideration for the collective interest. Now first it's a reasoned habit as opposed to a blind habit or an instinctive habit of the kind that we observe even in the animal world. There are many examples of uh, cooperation and things that look like public spiritedness in the animal world, which they have learned to do 
in the process of evolution, not because of conscious, deliberate, reasoned habit of thought, but because of um, uh, of the evolution process. Uh, if I have time, at the end of the lecture, I will show you a short video uh, about cooperation among elephants. It's really interesting to see the extent to which uh, cooperation has evolved among elephants, who are among the more intelligent animals. And if you want to see more of them, you just have to type cooperation among animals on YouTube, and you'll find a whole series of these videos. Um, the fact that Cooperation has survival value. That's why we observe it in the animal world, because cooperation has survival value. It's a point that was made very beautifully and powerfully at the end of the 19th century by Peter Kropotkin in a book called Mutual Aid, which is still well worth reading today, uh, where he explained, this was a little bit after Darwin, after Darwin's book on the origins of species, uh, which spoke about the evolutionary process. And the main focus of attention at that time was on the so-called survival of the fittest. So the evolutionary process, process was thought of as a kind of struggle and only the strongest would survive. Actually, that, that's a bit of a misreading of Darwin. But anyway, he pointed out that actually cooperation can also have survival value and that the species that learn to cooperate uh, tend to survive and flourish and the other ones not so. He also pointed out that the more sociable animals that develop these habit, habits of cooperation are also the ones to tend to develop intelligence, which is what you would expect, because intelligence basically develops through interaction with fellow uh, human beings or animals. Anyway, so this is one thing. This is cooperation through evolution without reason, and it's not what I'm really interested in. So that's why the word reason uh, falls, uh, belongs to that definition. Uh, secondly, a reasoned habit habit of thought or a habit of action, um, as distinguished from thinking of public spiritedness primarily as an ethical commitment uh, like altruism, like you, know, you care for other people and therefore you do something for them, which is perfectly valid. I mean, there's, there's a place for altruism also, and you know, we could have a lecture on altruism in this small time. Uh, but that's an ethical commitment, that you feel that you ought to care for others. But the point I want to make in this lecture, of one point I want to make, is precisely that public spiritedness doesn't necessarily require a very strong ethical commitment or altruism of that kind. It can just be a habit of behavior or a habit of thought. And precisely because it may not require very strong ethical commitments, uh, it is uh, quite widespread already and can, can spread much further. So reason habit of consideration for the collective interest. Now consideration, of course, is a matter of degree. It could be a relatively superficial consideration, or it could be all the way to giving importance only to the collective interest and not at all to yourself. That would be a kind of self-sacrifice, which would be an extreme form of public, public spiritedness, uh, as has been cultivated by people like Mahatma Gandhi or Mother Teresa or Bhagat Singh. Uh, Bhagat Singh's case is particularly interesting because um, here was a young man in his 20s who gave up his life for the national struggle and who had no religious beliefs whatsoever and no hope at all of any kind of reward in the afterlife. And he explained his motivation uh, quite nicely in his book, uh, Why I Am an Atheist. It's quite, quite worth, worth reading uh, because he tries to explain why he sacrifices his life. Uh, without any hope of any kind of reward in the afterworld. Uh, just uh, quote a few, few lines. Uh, <clears throat> this is a, just a few days before he was executed. Uh, he says, what hope should I entertain? I know that will be the end when the rope is tightened around my neck and the rafters move from under my feet. My soul will come to nothing. A short life of struggle with no such magnificent end shall be my reward, that is all. Without any selfish motive of getting any reward here on the, or in the hereafter, quite disinterestedly, I have devoted my life to the cause of freedom. I could not act otherwise. I could not act otherwise. This is very, the most interesting part of the statement. You know, he's about to give up his life at the age of, you know, barely 20, and he says, he's trying to explain his motive he said, I could not act otherwise. Um, 
So this is self-sacrifice. Again, it's not exactly what I'm interested in. I'm more interested in everyday forms of uh, uh, public spiritedness where we give some weight or some consideration to the public interest and maybe also to our own interests. And we don't you know, sacrifice ourselves, but we, nor do we ignore the collective interest. And finally, collective interest. Now the word collective, of course, could refer to different things. Uh, it could be the family, it could be the society, it could be the country, it could be the village. Uh, it could even be the world at large. You know, when, when somebody spends money to buy an electric car uh, as opposed to another car because they feel that they feel concerned about global warming. It's a kind of public spiritedness uh, focused on the world as a whole. I mean, you know, climate change is not something that affects you or your country. It affects the entire humanity. And obviously, buying an electric car has a minute impact on the amount of global warming. And yet, it's the kind of thing that some people do. So the collectivity could be of the, all sorts of different kinds. OK, now let me give a couple of constructive examples of uh, the kind of public spiritedness that I have in mind. Um, one interesting example, which uh, will serve my purpose quite well, I give two examples. Uh, one is punctuality. You know, when you have to go somewhere, you go at the time that has been proposed. Um, now, some societies are very punctual, some societies are very unpunctual. Uh, India is not the worst by any means, apparently, the society is. You know, people go hours late when there's a meeting. Anyway, when you go to a meeting, there's of course a temptation to go a little late because you think that, you know, everyone else may not come on time, so if I go a little late, let's say 10 minutes, uh, I won't have to wait for other people. And then you realize that maybe other people are reasoning in the same way, so it may be safer to go 20 minutes late. And then you think, well, maybe they're also thinking the same thing. Uh, so how about 30 minutes? And then it goes on like that, and the effect can be that uh, people turn up really very late, one hour, two hours. And uh, <coughs> um, this situation is a little similar to what is called escalation games in game theory. Um, and one interesting feature of escalation games is that they can really get out of hand very badly. Uh, this point was made uh, very clearly many years ago by a game theorist called Martin Schubik through a very simple game called the dollar auction game. Uh, so uh, the game is like this, that you auction, let's say, forget the dollar, let's say 100 rupee note. You, know, you, you have two players and they are competing for that 100 rupee note and they have to bid in increments of, let us say, 10 rupees. So if the first player offers 10 rupees for that 100 rupee note and the second player has to either offer 20 rupees or give up. And if the second player offers 20 rupees and the first player, so the first player is turn again, and he or she has to offer 30 rupees or give up. And it goes on like that until one of the two players gives up. And at that point, the highest bidder gets the note, and both the players have to bid whatever, the, whatever they have bid. Okay? That's the game. Now, when you do that, you can try it for yourself. But apparently what happens is that people keep bidding way beyond 100 rupees. Not always, but very often people keep bidding because at each step, when you fear that if you give up, you will lose what you have already bid, it looks worthwhile to bid another 10 rupees in the hope that the other person will give up, and then uh, you will at least get the 100 rupees. But if it, of course, at every step you reason like that, but it, you know, it can go on for a while, and since both players reason in the same way, it can really get, go on for quite a long time uh, before any of the two gives up, and then when you end up bidding more than 100 rupees to get 100 rupees, it makes absolutely no sense at all. So it's a case where the outcome is completely irrational, but it's an outcome of the fact that the game proceeds in step, and at each step it looks rational to continue, but uh, by the end of the game you're, you're doing something that doesn't make any sense at all. So um, now that's a very trivial, it sounds like a trivial game, but there are a lot of things in social life that are very much like escalation games. I mean, every day in the newspapers, there are stories, for example, of uh, two women coming to a tap with a bucket and they fight over who should uh, fill their bucket first. Uh, first me, first me. Then the tempers uh, free a little bit. Then one of them slaps the other one. The other one goes home and gets her brother. The brothers come back, come back with a latte. And it goes on like that. And by the end of the day, uh, somebody is dead. And there are all kinds of stories like that. I used to collect them. I have a whole series of them. 
Um, and then there are even worse examples. The, the First World War was a bit like a huge escalation game. You know, things just went out of hand. And people started, it started to be one assassination, and then so sort of escalated, and then people started fighting, not really knowing why they were fighting, but it just went on and on for four years. And according to the historian Eric Hobsbawm, about 5,000 books have been written to this day about the causes of World War, War, the World War I, and we still don't know quite how and why it happened. It just, you know, flared up. Um, so punctuality is a bit like that, that if you start, if you get into this game, of speculating how late other people are going to be and trying to be a little bit later than them so that you don't have to wait for them. You basically get into a kind of mental escalation game and the outcome can be pretty bad. And the habit of punctuality is basically <coughs> a way of cutting through. I mean, it's basically a way of preventing you from being, playing the game and saying, look, <coughs> just be there on time. Who's we'll stop. <laughs> no, <laughs> don't start trying to speculate what time you should be there. Just be there because that's the time that has been appointed. And uh, in a punctual society, people don't decide on a case-by-case -case basis, you know, oh, I'm going to that meeting, should I be punctual now? Should I'm going to another meeting, should I go a little bit late? They just develop that habit that, you know, a certain time is a certain time. And uh, uh, it's not a mindless habit. It's something that they can think about and reason and see uh, would be some, uh, some would be a useful social norm to have. So, but ultimately they do behave more out of habit than out of case-by-case -case reasoning. And as I mentioned earlier, it's not that in punctual societies, people are more altruistic. You know, the Japanese are said to be very punctual. Uh, in my experience, my limited experience is true. Indians are, Indians are not very punctual. Does it mean that the Japanese are better than Indians? No, it's not that they are more caring or more selfless. They have just developed a certain culture of punctuality which serves everybody well, and that therefore people understand is worth uh, preserving. And uh, you know, there's nothing that prevents uh, the same kind of <coughs> culture of punctuality to develop in any other country. Uh, so this example, I like this example because it does illustrate many of the points that I mentioned at the very beginning that uh, we can think of public spiritedness as a habit of thought, that it matters for the quality of life. Uh, you may not think that punctuality country is a big deal. In fact, uh, the writer uh, Arkin Arayan has a little story called, called Better Late, where he argues that punctuality is really no big deal. He says, uh, personally speaking, I feel that under normal circumstances, most things can survive a little delay. In a country like ours, that's India, the preoccupation is with eternity, <coughs> and a little measure of time is hardly ever noticed. Now that's one point of view to make. <laughs> um, he was, of course, not entirely serious. Uh, but there's another point of view which was well expressed by Bertrand Russell, that actually it is a big deal. He said, punctuality is a quality, the need of which is bound up with social cooperation. It, it facilitates all kinds of uh, social cooperation. It has nothing to do with the relations of the soul to God, or with mystic insight, or with any of the matters with which the more elevated and spiritual moralists are concerned. This is the same point I'm making. It's not a matter of ethics. One would be surprised to find a saint getting drunk, but one would not be surprised to find him late for an engagement. Yeah, so he can be a saint. He can still have failed to develop that habit of punctuality. And yet, in the ordinary business of life, punctuality is absolutely necessary. And you, know, you can think of many uh, important situations where punctuality can really help. Uh, to get things done. So, it matters for the quality of life. Um, it uh, exists to a significant <coughs> extent already in most societies, and it can be cultivated. You know, there's nothing particularly impossible about uh, cultivating uh, and helping people to cultivate habits of punctuality. A uh, second example is even more useful for my purpose, and uh, <coughs> I'll show you a couple of photographs here. This is the act of voting. You know, when we vote, we go to the polling booth. Um, oh, what's happening now? This video can go <coughs> on the mouse pad, or the touch pad. Sorry? Okay, so here is uh, 
someone going to the polling booth to cast a vote. Um, there are photos like this coming out in the papers every time there's an election, and I'm sure we'll see more in the next few months with all these elections coming up. I have a whole collection of them. Uh, this is a particularly interesting one. You can see this old woman who is also disabled, um, struggling to go to the polling booth. She seems to be maybe even in pain, but she really wants to go there. And uh, these police officers are helping them. Uh, so there's a kind of triple expression of public spiritedness. There's a public spiritedness of this woman who's going to the polling booth in spite of all great difficulties, probably knowing that her vote actually is not really going to matter because it's only one vote among millions. And in any case, even if it does matter, what can she hope to get for herself from a different government? I mean, you know, obviously, it's hard to think of anything substantial that she might get from uh, getting one party into power as opposed to another. Um, so there's the public spiritedness of the woman and then of the police officers who are helping her, and then of the photographer who's taking that photograph and getting it published and obviously thinking that this is something that can give inspiration to people. But now, <clears throat> um, one reason why this is an interesting example is that this act of voting, when we go and vote, uh, knowing very well that <coughs> um, our vote is not going to really matter except in the extraordinarily, extraordinarily unlikely event where there's a tie otherwise and our vote becomes a casting, casting vote, which is virtually impossible to happen. Uh, we go, nevertheless, to the polling booth. And this is a case where many of the standards arguments, arguments that are often invoked to explain this kind of cooperative behavior without giving up this, what I call the superstition, this hypothesis of self-interest. Uh, many of these arguments don't work. What are the kinds of arguments that are invoked? Well, um, the influence of social norms that people may do certain things that are not necessarily in their own self-interest because of social norms. Uh, reputation effects, you know, they try to maintain a certain reputation. So they do certain things that look public spirited, but actually they are, it actually benefits them because they're building their reputation. Or there's some kind of an evolutionary process that enables people to develop these habits a little bit like the animals and the elephants also have learned to cooperate. None of that applies here. This is a one-off gesture. Uh, she goes to the board, there's no evolutionary process. There's no social norm involved. There's no such thing as a norm that you have to vote. People are free to vote. If they don't vote, there's no social stigma. There's no reputation involved. And yet, she makes that effort, and she goes to the polling booth. Now, you can explain that in many different ways. Uh, but what interests me here is the possibility that she, she's just doing it um, as if her vote matters. She feels she's not going to the polling booth on her own. She feels part of the public that's going to the polling booth. And she behaves as if her vote mattered, even though if you press her, she will agree that, yeah, of course, my vote doesn't matter. But no, we have to go and we have to vote. And it's interesting that in a recent survey done by the CSDS, uh, when people were, were asked whether their vote has an, inf an effect on how things are run in the country, 60% of people said yes. Now, they can't literally believe it in most cases. I think people, most people understand that my vote doesn't really matter. But they <coughs> behave as if their vote matters. And I'm going to argue later on that there's absolutely nothing irrational about that, about going to a vote as if your vote matters. Um, this is also a good example because it shows that even though public spiritedness may sound like something that's very rare and it's more like the exception than the rule and that for practical purposes it's good enough to assume that people are self-interested. In fact, in this case, the entire edifice of democracy relies on the simple act of public, public spiritedness of going to the polling booth. Sometimes people do it against great odds. Of course, some people enjoy it. That's also another possibility. But many people do it against, uh, you know, in cold weather, in the heat, uh, in this case, uh, uh, in spite of distance or physical obstacles. Um, so the, the whole edifice of democracy depends on this very simple everyday act of the public spiritedness, uh, which shows that it's not as rare, nor is it as inconsequential as we think, even already in the society today. Okay, 
So um, I hope that the notion I have in mind is sufficiently clear now. Um, I want to say a few words about uh, why it is important and how it can be important for development. Um, this is something that is not particularly well recognized in development economics, partly because <coughs> of this addiction I referred to earlier to the notion that people are self-interested, and also uh, because of an addiction to economic models where self-interest, um, where there's a congruence between self-interest and the common good. Uh, and in this context, Adam Smith's observ observation that it is not from, from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own interest. This is often quoted to illustrate the fact that when everyone behaves in their own interest, sometimes it's good for the society as a whole. And there is an important insight in that story. It's an insight that has been formalized uh, in the so-called fundamental theorem of economics, if this means something to you, that under certain conditions, which are actually quite restrictive, you know, competition, full information, no externalities, and so on and so forth, under certain conditions, when consumers and enterprises pursue their own interests in the form of utility for consumers and profits for, uh, uh, for uh, enterprises, you actually do reach some sort of uh, limited social optimality that we call Pareto optimality. So there is an insight in the idea that in some circumstances, there is a congruence between uh, people pursuing their own self-interest and the, and the uh, realization of the collective interest. But that's only one uh, type of situation. It was the brewer, the baker, and the butcher. It's only one thing. And there are many other social situations of a completely opposite kind, where uh, the pursuit of self-interest undermines the common good and where public spiritedness can help to overcome that tension. This is uh, formally uh, the situation that is known as the prisoner's dilemma. I'll explain that in more detail later and discuss uh, the nature of that situation. But the examples I've already given um, uh, will give you an idea of what I have in mind. Now, let me give you some examples of uh, various domains where uh, culture of public spiritedness could make a difference to development and the quality of life. Uh, one very important domain is um, the provision of public services and particularly of health and education. Nothing is more important for the quality of life than health. If you're not in good health, uh, you can't feel good, you can't work, you can't study, you can't uh, enjoy any kind of social life. You know, nothing can be built uh, on the foundation of ill health. And similarly, education is very important. If there's one thing we have learned in development economics in the last 20 years, it is the importance of education for development in so many ways. You know, education is important for economic growth, it's important for health, it's important for demographic change, it's important for democracy, you know, it's important for so many different aspects of development. And both health and education uh, are not very well not very efficiently provided by the market. When Adam Smith spoke, spoke about the butcher and the baker and the, and the brewer, he was careful not to speak of the teacher and the doctor and the lawyer. That would be a very, because his, his analogy, his argument would not have had much weight had he been talk, talking about the teacher and the doctor or the doctor. Uh, in fields like health and education, there are many well understood reasons why market processes don't deliver anything like the kind of efficiency that might, might apply to other kinds of markets like the market for bread or beer. Uh, there are problems of asymmetric information, there are problems of externalities, there are problems of equity. Um, and for all these reasons, um, uh, a well-functioning uh, public health system or public education system can perform enormously better than the market, at least in principle. But that, of course, requires a certain level of effectiveness in the public system itself, which may or may not be there. Um, and it's very hard to see how you could run a really effective public healthcare system uh, or a really effective public schooling system without some kind of culture of uh, conscientiousness and public on the part of teachers and doctors. 
because teachers and doctors have an overwhelming power over uh, the patients and the children. And unless they have some kind of concern for them and for the integrity of the profession, uh, they can really misuse that power. Um, now, <coughs> if you look around India, if you look at different states in India, at the work culture, let us say, of the teaching profession, you find a lot of very sharp contrasts. And these contrasts are quite interesting because the system is basically the same. You know, it's the same salaries, by and large, it's the same inspection system, it's the same curriculum, it's largely the same infrastructure. And yet there are places where the work culture among teachers has, com has completely broken down. Uh, they don't turn up, they turn up, they don't teach. Um, sometimes they need to be drunk. And then there are places in India where you find a reasonably, in the same system, you find teachers who are doing still reasonably well. And uh, they come and they teach, and they seem, seem to have some kind of concern for the quality of the school and the welfare of the children. And that makes a world of difference. Nothing can make more difference to a public school than the attitude and the commitment to the teacher. Uh, here is how, in, uh, this is a <clears throat> little quote from a recent survey of uh, schools in Tamil Nadu where th things tend to work a little better. And uh, <clears throat> this is what the author writes, in every village we visited, the school would be open and functioning. <coughs> One teacher, when we asked why they took the trouble to come to the school every day and stay all day, especially because this village was not very well connected, <coughs> responded by saying, this is our duty, we have no choice. Yeah? So it's again, they didn't say, oh, we love the children, you know, we're sacrificing ourselves for them. They said, no, we're teachers, we teach, that's all. You know? So they had, they had this inbuilt habit of, oops, of uh, uh, basically doing their duty in a way that doesn't apply in some other parts of India where it's considered uh, all right for teachers to be absent half of the time or to read a newspaper, newspaper uh, in the classroom. So it's again the same point. Just like the Japanese are not necessarily more altruistic than the Indians, but they have developed some useful habits of thought and punctuality. Similarly, the teacher, the teaching profession in some parts of India has a certain work culture and certain habits of behavior and thought that are extremely helpful and that are lacking in other parts of India, but that can uh, hopefully be cultivated. And we can make similar remarks in the field of healthcare. Um, another field where um, regard for the collect collective interest can be extremely important is that of environmental protection. Uh, environmental vandalism is one of the major fields of antisocial behavior. Littering the streets, over, over extracting groundwater, um, Felling trees, overusing electricity are some examples among many of antisocial behavior <coughs> with dire environmental consequences. Now, there are many ways of dealing with this and of trying to limit this sort of environmental vandalism. But uh, here again, public spiritedness can play an important role. For example, if you can impart the habit. Uh, if you ensure that people have the habit uh, of uh, putting their garbage in the dustbin instead of throwing it all over the place, uh, half of the job of keeping the city clean is done. Yeah? But if people throw their biscuit packets in the street and, and, uh, and spit and, and, uh, and worse uh, on the street, then you have to send somebody to clean it up every single day. And yet, even then, it looks pretty bad. Um, any of you who has taken the metro must have been struck by the fact that the same people who are doing all this vandalism on the surface, when they go down the metro, somehow uh, they seem to refrain from any kind of vandalism. And not, nobody throws as much as a cigarette butt on the floor, and there's a great atmosphere of cleanliness, even though you see very, very few cleaning staff. I'm sure it's very cleaned less frequently than the surface, but it looks enormously uh, idea because somehow underground people have these have that have developed that habit. And again it's not that they're different people when they are underground and they're overground. You know, you get in the metro, you think you see, you know, night as you see it's full metro and it feels good. And I think most people just think, well let's let's keep it that way. Why should we vandalize? Yeah? So again it conveys that it's not a matter of it's not necessarily a matter of ethics, it's a matter of uh, organizing that kind of collective 
habits that uh, serves the collective interest. Last example is about the corruption. Uh, corruption broadly defined as the use of public resources for private gain. That's basically what corruption, most forms of corruption are about. Uh, is again a prime example of antisocial behavior. And corruption can be very difficult to eradicate when it becomes, uh, when illegitimate transactions become accepted as the normal state of affairs, which is the state, which is the situation in many societies that you know, corruption is considered no big deal. In fact, it's considered that you know, to get any work done, you have to give some kind of financial inducement, and there's nothing wrong with it. I remember talking to a contractor in Orissa who explained to me, he was, I'm sorry to say that he was a graduate of Delhi University, and he said that in this uh, area, we work on the PC system, the percentage <coughs> system. And then he gave me a whole breakdown. When we build a road, for example, we give 3% to the BDO, 5% to the accountant, 2% to such and such, uh, the treasurer, whatever. It all added up to 22%. 22% of the budget is for bribes. And then I asked him, suppose that the BDO is an honest person, then what happens? He said, well, if the BDO is honest, then he will stick with 3%. You know, so basically, honesty has been redefined as sticking to the stipulated shares and not more than that. So then, in that kind of situation, it just can be very difficult to eradicate corruption. And again, there are many ways of fighting corruption. And there's a big battle going on uh, about this at this time in India. And it's not at all based only on public spiritedness. But the real battle against corruption would be won when uh, the work culture in public administration would be such that um, people are expected to do their duty without this kind of legal, legal inducement. And when those who perform the duty stop even thinking about asking about the kinds of bribes that are thought to be, um, uh, that are so common and thought to be so legitimate today. So again, it's a domain where uh, habits of thought and social norms uh, matter a great deal and can be changed. I'm not suggesting at all that cultivating public spiritedness is the answer to corruption. Um, but this example illustrates once again how public spiritedness can contribute to development and quality of life. So I hope the point is made now, and I'll move on and try to think a little bit about what is the kind of thought process that underlies these attitudes of, uh, these attitudes of public spiritedness and how they can be cultivated. Uh, from here onwards, it's a bit of an experimental lecture because I don't think there's a lot of clarity on these matters, but I'll float a few thoughts and let me uh, let you uh, think about them a little further. So let's go back to the person who uh, goes to vote um, at the polling booth, or the person who's punctual, or another example that we've talked about if there had been time is um, keeping a queue. Keeping a queue again is an, ex an example of a public spirited habit of thought, that you don't jump the queue uh, because you know that if people jump the queue, it may be good for yourself, but it really could lead to the break of the queue everybody will be worse off as a result, so you just keep the queue. Uh, so let's, let's think of people who do all these things and ask what is the uh, kind of reasoning that goes on in their head and how rational, how rational is it and how can it be facilitated. Now we can try to get some help to like answer this question from game theory, which is basically the study of rational decisions in situations where people's decisions are interdependent. So the outcome of what I do depends not only on what I do, but also on what other people do, which applies to all the situations that I've discussed so far. Um, and those of you who have had, I don't know how many of you have, but those of you who have read a little bit of basic game theory would have recognized that most of the examples of antisocial behavior that I did earlier have the formal structure of what is known as the prisoner's dilemma. And I think many of you would have heard of the prisoner's dilemma, even if you haven't uh, read any game theory. So it's a good place to start. So what is the prisoner's dilemma story? I think many of you would know it. Uh, two prisoners are in prison in two different cells. They can't communicate. This is very important for the whole uh, argument. And they have been told that by the morning, they have to decide whether to confess their crime or to deny their crime. <coughs> and if both <coughs> deny the crime, 
then it will be assumed that it tells the truth and they will be set free. <coughs> if uh, both confess the crime, then they will get a mild sentence. But if one confesses and one denies, then the first one gets a reward, not only goes free, but also with a reward for telling the truth, and the other one gets a harsh sentence. Okay? That's the situation. So, formally speaking, what, what game theorists call a game is basically three things. Players, strategies, and then payoffs. So here there are two players, the two prisoners. Each of them has, has two strategies, either confess or deny, and then the payoffs are as I have described. Now let's put ourselves in the shoes of one of the two prisoners. Okay, so you think, if the other person is going to confess, then I should confess, otherwise I'll get a harsh punishment, right? And if the other person is going to deny the crime, then I'm better off confessing, because then I get a reward, I go free and I get a reward, okay? So whatever the other person does, it sounds like what I should do <coughs> is to confess. And if both reason that way, then they, are both, they end up both confessing and staying in prison with a mild sentence. Whereas if they had both denied the crime, if they had been somehow able to either agree by communicating that they would deny the crime, or follow the different reasoning that would have led them to decide to deny the crime, then they would have been set free. So it's a, it's a situation where, first of all, each player has what we call a dominant strategy. Dominant strategy means something that is better for you to do, no matter what the other person does, okay? And one of, one of the first principles of game theory is that if you have a dominant strategy, then you should play it, obviously, yeah? If there's something that's better for you to do, no matter what anyone else does, then you should do it. That sounds obvious. I'll come back later to whether it's really so obvious, but it sounds obvious. And though, so in this situation, both each player has a dominant strategy, so it seems very compelling that if they are rational people, then each of them should confess. And yet, when both do that, they end up being both worse off than they would have been if they had been somehow able to deny the crime together. Yeah? So it's, um, uh, the lesson is that this is a situation, and there are many situations of that type in this life, <coughs> Uh, where the pursuit of self-interest is collectively self-defeating. It's like if you jump a queue, you are jumping the queue is a dominant strategy because if other people follow the queue, then you're better off jumping it. And if other people are going to break the queue, then you better rush also and not find yourself behind. It's again like a dominant strategy. But if every person in the queue follows the dominant strategy, what happens is that the queue breaks and then there's a big jam like we see in the human Delhi railway station all the time, or Alaba railway station, and it gets very difficult to get uh, to get uh, to the front of the queue. So it's a case where the pursuit of self-interest is collectively have self-defeating, and where the public interest seems to be hard to achieve because individual rationality appears to dictate <coughs> that each player <coughs> should pursue his or her own strategy, but this undermines the public interest. Yeah? So many of the examples I gave of uh, throwing litter on the street, um, jumping a queue, uh, all these examples of antisocial behavior, many of them have that formal structure of a prisoner's dilemma. <laughs> so the question is how can we escape this dilemma? How can we ensure that people actually follow the queue? There are many answers to that. You can police the queue, you can have a police officer with a lati like we see nowadays in, in the railway station telling people to follow the queue, and if you don't follow the queue, get whacked. Uh, you can um, invoke ethical principles. You can say, yeah, of course, it's your domain strategy to jump the queue, but you should not do it. It's wrong. It's wrong uh, behavior. So you can invoke ethical arguments, which are not in the domain of game theory, which have their own validity. You can invoke evolutionary arguments. You can say that people who learn to uh, follow cues or not to confess when they go to prison and they have committed a crime, uh, will somehow have some kind of survival advantage in the long run and that people will learn a little bit like the animals are learning to cooperate with us. We can also learn to cooperate in a prisoner's dilemma situation. Um, you can involve, involve social norms. It can be a norm that people learn to follow 
following clues, uh, even though the may or may not be in their own circuitry, just be some, just something that they learn to do as a matter of social norm. So there are various arguments you can uh, use to find a solution out of this dilemma. But in the short time that remains, maybe 15 minutes? OK. <laughs> I want to put forward, uh, I want to ask you more for another question, which is, how compelling is uh, this argument that uh, individual rationality necessarily demands that you should play your dominant strategy in a prisoner's dilemma situation? Would it be really irrational for the two prisoners to deny rather than confess, seeing that they would actually both be better of doing that if they were able to somehow convince themselves to do it? Um, and the, uh, what we have to do here is to see this analysis of the prisoner's dilemma in the light of the general lessons of game theory, which uh, one of which is that in these situations of interdependence, where what the outcome of what I do depends on what <coughs> other people also do, uh, very often rationality does not tell us how to behave. It's a very important lesson in game theory. I've already mentioned the escalation games, where we, if you get into an escalation process, you really can't tell how a rational person would behave. And there are many other examples of games like that, even very simple games. I'll just very quickly give you two examples. Uh, one is the, the repeated prisoner's dilemma. This is a very interesting game. So let's go back to the cube. Right? Following the cube is basically, as I explained, like a prisoner's dilemma. Now, I suppose that instead of having to form a single cube, suppose that somebody has to go, go through the bus stand every morning from Monday to Sunday. And every day, that problem poses itself. Should I um, run the queue or should I break the queue? Now, this is a bit different from the single shot prisoner's dilemma. Because when the game repeats itself, you can try to use your decisions in the early parts of the game to convey some information to the other players about what you are willing to do. Like, you might, you might follow the queue in the early days of the week to convey that if other people reciprocate, then you are willing to keep the queue. And if they do reciprocate, then it might <coughs> be possible to persuade everyone in the queue to actually follow the queue, and everyone would be better off as a result. That's the kind of thing that you might hope to achieve. Now, unfortunately, uh, the standard game theoretic analysis of this finite, finite repeated prisoner's dilemma game is as follows. <coughs> Instead of starting from Monday, let's, have, let's think of what will happen on Sunday. On Sunday, Sunday is the last day. After that, the game is finished. So on Sunday, everyone's dominant strategy is to break the queue. Yeah? On Sunday, it's like a one, it's like a one shot prisoner's dilemma, and we know that in the one shot prisoner's dilemma, every player has a dominant strategy, which in this case is to break the queue. So we know that the queue will break on Sunday. Now, what about Saturday? Well, having decided that on Sunday everyone's dominant strategy is to break the queue, and therefore knowing in advance that whatever you do on Saturday, the queue is going to break on Sunday. You might as well break it on Saturday as well. Right? Same reason. Okay? Then what about Friday? Same reason again. Let's break the queue. Thursday, Wednesday, Tuesday, Monday. Conclusion, a rational person will break the queue every day of the week, irrespective of what other people do. Unconditional defection. Now, this is an absurd conclusion from a common sense point of view. And this is really absurd that no matter what other people do, you make up your mind in advance that you will break the queue every day of the week. It doesn't make sense. And once you reject, once you see that that reasoning is actually misleading, and you reject that solution, it's not clear what else you might propose. And if, you, if you can work out a logical argument for a particular way of playing this finitely repeated prisoner's game, Dilemma, and please write to me. I will nominate you for the Nobel Prize because I'm not aware of any such solution. It's a case where it's actually not a matter of rational reasoning, or at least not only. It's also a question of experimental psychology, of uh, invoking other modes of thought than rational thinking, because rational thinking alone will not tell you what you have to do. I'll come back to that point, but first, another simple example. 
uh, this is called the chicken chicken game. Yeah? That's, some of you may have heard of it. It's the sort of game that uh, <coughs> teenagers apparently used to uh, play in the United States, where two players would get into a car, each in one car, and would drive towards each other at high speed. And then the first person who loses his or her nerves and gets off the road has lost the game. Yeah. So basically, the two players. Two strategies. One strategy is to cave in and get off the road, and the other strategy is just to drive on, yeah, to stand firm and hope that the other person will cave in. Otherwise, it's an accident. Okay. Uh, this is a very important uh, class of situations. Many violent conflicts are a bit like chicken games or escalation games. Is a different version of it, but it's a lot of it like that. Um, <coughs> there was recently a big chicken game between Obama and the Republicans in the US where Obama said, if you don't um, allow me to increase the budget, then the financial system will go down. And the Republicans, says, the Republicans said, if you don't dilute your Obamacare assets by the same date, then sorry, we are not going to budge. And there's going to be the financial system will um, collapse. And in this particular case, of course, catastrophe was averted. The Republicans caved in at the last minute. Um, the Cuban Missile Crisis, which is even worse, I mean, that really threatened uh, to destroy the entire world. And in fact, today, with the documentation that we have about what happened at that time, uh, we know, we get to know more and more each day how close the world had come at that time to a global nuclear war. And it was basically a chicken game. I mean, can it be from the Russians in the movie or missiles from Cuba or its war? And the Russians said, let us put our missiles in Cuba or its war. Unfortunately, again, in this case, one of the two came in, and there was no catastrophe. Anyway, now, <clears throat> again, very simple game, two players, two strategies, as simple as you can have. But a game theorist cannot tell you how you should behave in that situation. <coughs> it's not a matter of rational analysis. The game theorist can help you to understand the nature of the situation, but cannot tell you whether you should stand firm or cave in. I, it may sound like the right thing to do is to cave in, but if you care sufficiently for the stakes, like Obama really cared for Obamacare, and he stood firm, maybe it was the right thing to do, even though it involved a serious risk of bringing the whole financial system down. So rational analysis in this situation cannot tell you what to do. You know, it's more, but it's a war of nerves, it's psychology, it's, uh, it's a matter of experimental psychology, it's not a matter of rationality. So, what I'm trying to bring to illustrate from these two simple things is that rational analysis does not, very often does not tell you what to do in a situation where people's decisions are interdependent. And these two examples also help to understand the root of the problem. What is the root of the problem? The root of the problem is that to decide what to do, you have to guess what the other player is going to do, right? And to guess what the other player is going to do, you have to guess what the player is guessing about what you are going to do. And to guess what the other player is guessing about what you are going to do, you have to guess what the other player is guessing you are guessing what he or she is going to do, and so on and so forth. So there's a kind of infinite uh, second guessing problem, and it's very hard to get out of it. It's like punctuality when you're trying to, you keep trying to second guess how late other people are going to be. You just get into a huge mess, and therefore it's maybe better, maybe better not to engage in the speculation at all, and for heaven's sake, just go at the appointed time. This point was made very well many years ago by Herbert Simon, who got the Nobel Prize in Economics, I, I believe, I think, or the uh -huh. Nobel Prize for something. He said the real importance of game theory lies in his demonstration of the intractability of the problem of defining rationality in situations where people try to outwit each other. Now, this is not a defeat. In fact, it is one thing that makes life interesting. If, if, if in every social situation there was a rational way to behave, then we would be like computers. We would just have to figure out what is the best way to pursue my interest, and then we would just have to get on with it. And because rationality doesn't always take us very far, sometimes it does, but sometimes it doesn't, uh, there is scope for a lot of other modes of thought, for ethical reasoning, for following social norms, for following habits of thought, uh, for following emotions. There are all kinds of ways of taking decisions which are not irrational. They are non-rational. The, the fact that you 
don't follow rational reasoning alone. It doesn't mean that you are irrational. You may be irrational, of course, but it can be that, that you follow non-rational modes of thought which may have their own validity. So now coming back to the perimeter dilemma, in these situations, which are very many, where there's no obvious resolution to the game that you're trying to play, and where rationality alone doesn't tell you what to do, what do people actually do? Well, as I said, they follow different kinds of uh, reasoning or principles. And very often, they follow some kind of rule of thumb. For example, here's an example of the rule of thumb. <coughs> so in this situation, where you're, not, you're not able to guess what the other player is going to do, because that involves guessing what they're guessing, what, what you are going to do, and so on and so forth. How about saying the following, that the chicken game and the prisoner's dilemma and so on, they are all symmetric games. There are two players and they are basically, by assumption, more or less identical, and they have the same strategies. So how about assuming that since the other player is like me, the other player is going to do the same that I'm going to do? <coughs> now, you can't really justify that assumption, but suppose we try that, because we don't really know what to do. Suppose you try that assumption. It doesn't sound absurd either. Well, it turns out to work pretty well in many situations, uh, including the other people posing this dilemma. And if you invoke that kind of principle in many situations and it actually works, why wouldn't you also use the same kind of principles in the prisoner's dilemma situation? Why would you have a split personality where you follow certain principles of action in certain situations and other principles of action in other situations? That doesn't sound necessarily like a good thing to do. And in a prisoner's dilemma situation, if you reason, as I have just mentioned, that you, are, you assume that the other person is going to do the same as what you are going to do, because that other person is basically the same, what would you do? Confess or deny? <coughs> right? if, you, if you can assume safely that the other person is going to do the same as you are doing, then you would much prefer to deny, because then you would all uh, go, th go free. Now, I have to warn you that most game theorists would uh, disagree very strongly with this kind of reasoning. And uh, just in case you didn't follow it because it's not entirely transparent, I'll conclude with a simple dialogue with, between a game theorist and a public, spirit, uh, public spirited citizen on this issue. And then I will let you make up your mind uh, who is more convincing. And I will let you take the dialogue further. So here's the uh, dialogue. And then I'll show you the elephants, because I think we have time. Um, OK, so they're discussing what to do if fire breaks out in the cinema. Now, if fire breaks out in the cinema, the only way people can survive, can survive is to make a queue <coughs> and follow the queue. And if everyone tries to get to the door at the same time, then the chances are that everybody will perish. But obviously, it's not easy in a situation like that to be disciplined and to follow the queue. So the game theory start by asking, Suppose that you're watching a film in the cinema hall and fire breaks out. What would you do? Form a queue or rush towards the door? So the uh, <coughs> public spiritism, spirited citizen says, I will form a queue because that's the only way people can get out. If everyone rushes to the door, everyone will perish. Game theorist. I'm not asking you what other people should do. I'm asking you what you will do. Can't you see that other people may or may not cooperate forming the queue. And even if they do, aren't you better off jumping the queue? In fact, you're better off rushing to the door, whatever other people do, whether or not they form the queue. That's what we call a dominant strategy. And if there's a dominant strategy, you should always follow it. <coughs> Citizen, yes, but if everyone reasons like this, there will be a jam, and everyone will perish. Game theorists, you are very stubborn. <coughs> I'm not asking you what would happen if other people did this or that. I'm asking you to think about how to stay alive in this situation. Citizen, well, in this country, people are used to forming a queue when the fire breaks out, and that sounds like a good idea. Once I went to another country where people rush to the door when there's a fire, and I noticed that they all perish each time. So that doesn't <coughs> sound like a good way to go about it. I much prefer to <coughs> form a queue. Game theorist, fair enough. But can't you see that if other people form a queue, as you seem to expect that they will, then you're better off jumping the queue. You will be the first one to get out. Citizen, yes. But if I reason like this, what stops other people from reasoning like that too? And then everyone will perish. Game theorist. 
Don't be absurd. There's no such thing as telepathy. You are all taking your decisions independently. Whether or not you jump the queue has no bearing on whether other people do it or not. Citizens, I'm not saying that there's telepathy. It's just that I'm used to behaving as if other people were going to behave in the same way. After all, they are in the same situation and they're basically people like me. So what's wrong in taking my own decision based on the assumption that other people would take the same decision? It seems to work. Okay, you continue and you make up your mind. Coming back to that poor woman who is going to the polling booth, I think it's something like that that's happening in your mind. She, she behaves as if uh, other people are doing the same or as if her vote mattered. In fact, as I mentioned, in survey responses, most people say or claim to think that their own vote matters. So it's a kind of reasoning like that that goes on. And uh, uh, I don't think there's anything <coughs> irrational uh, or unreasonable about it. So the basic question is, there's a lot of scope for participatory behavior in human society and a lot of need for it and a lot of possibilities of cultivate, cultivating, cultivating it much beyond what has already happened. That is the point that I wanted to emphasize today. I'll stop here. Any other friends, maybe we can go after the discussion, or? Um, I think some of you perhaps want to leave, especially the ones who are past six. Yeah, I mean, they're all quite fidgety at the back. OK. <laughs> so you'll be the charge. <laughs>